So hi, everybody. Uh, this is the spring 2023 series Showcase. Uh, we're really happy that we have a good turnout this time. And there, of course, more people will be coming in throughout the day. A quick, oh, are the slides moving? Yes. A quick overview of the program. We like to think of ourselves as an incubator and accelerator for data science, machine learning, AI research throughout the campus. This initiative is part of the, uh, the Division of Computing Data Science and Society. Uh, led, led by the Data Science Undergraduate Studies Program uh, with the support of the Berkeley Institute of Data Science and the D-Lab. We also would like to thank our partners in Research IT and the, uh, Oliver O'Reilly and his, his office. Okay, uh, we want to definitely highlight some success we've had recently over the past year or two. Um, we had a great project that's very applied in nature, such as the pro pro project with IBM to uh, analyze mangrove growth grow forests and the impact of climate change on them. Uh, we also have very kind of cutting edge research projects in astrophysics, astronomy. Uh, there's a we have a project on ash, uh, B162 asteroid and a uh, continuing analysis on that project. So this spring we had a record number of projects. We had about exactly 115 projects this semester with a variety of partners. Some of you, some of which you can see here, uh, ranging from the UN to companies like Merck uh, to different departments on campus and to even other academic institutions across the country. So uh, in Dahl, uh, since the program started, we have had almost uh, 755 projects with the Discovery Program, and we hope to continue to grow that in the coming semesters. Over 2,200 students have been part of this program, and this semester alone, we have more than 400 students to be part of the program. So uh, we're, we're, we're a large program, and we're continuing to grow. So, and... One, one other thing I want to share is the diversity of the program. Uh, this is not only for data science majors. We have majors from every department you can imagine, uh, many from the computer sciences, but uh, as you can see, almost 30% from uh, domains that are, go beyond the traditional areas of data science and computer science. And now I'll turn the, uh, turn the event over to our MC, Venetia. Hi, everyone. I'm Venetia, and I'm going to go over the event timeline. Um, we're first going to start off with a program introduction from 1 to 110, um, and then we're going to go with our keynote speaker, um, Professor Fernando Perez. Um, then we'll be going into team awards and um, presentations, as well as a small break and transition at 2.30. Um, and then after that, we'll be having our poster board presentations from 2.35 to 4.35. I'm going to be going over the amazing staff that helps us um, run the data discovery program. Um, we have the discovery graduate fellows. Um, if anyone's here, like, please stand up. It's cool. um, we also have the discovery operations team. We also have the discovery consultants. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the team, like helping running this smoothly. Next, we're gonna move on to our keynote speaker, which is Professor Fernando Perez. Um, he's an associate professor in statistics and a faculty scientist in LBNL's data science and technology division. Um, he's the co-founder of Project Jupiter, and he also teaches the popular data science upper division course, Data 100. Um, so, Professor, if you wanna... And everyone, um, thank you, uh, Anthony and the team for inviting me and for giving me kind of the opportunity to meet you all. I'm sure some of you, a uh, quick show of hands, who here has taken Data 100 or Stat 51 with uh, 159 with me? Cool. Awesome. Well, I hope you had a good experience. I hope it was worth your time. Uh, I'm delighted I had a chance to take a look at some of the, the posters that were presented outside uh, just before we came in. And uh, and it was uh, it was great to see kind of the, the breadth of projects that you've all been working in. Uh, I think this discovery program is absolutely uh, fantastic. It's a, it's a wonderful effort uh, that, that allows you to connect with research of many kinds. Um, I want to tell you... Um, I want to tell you just a, a tiny little bit about, oh, that, that's weird. There's a difference. I've never seen this in Google Slide. That CO should be the uh, Columbia flag emoji, which I pasted yesterday. And I saw, and I've never seen that discrepancy in, uh, in, in Google Slides. But anyways, um, so a little bit about kind of where where I come from. I want to talk, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the bigger picture of, uh, of 
Project Jupiter and some of the tools that, that you use uh, and that I saw in, in that you've used in the classes and that I've seen uh, reflected in some of your posters in, um, in kind of how, how they came to be a little bit, why they are the way they are and kind of what, what horizons they connect to in, in data science. Uh, for me, it all started as a student in Colombia. I, I was born and raised in Medellin, Colombia and my undergraduate degree was in, in physics. And at the time I was working on something called the, the three body problem, the electrostatic three body problem. Uh, what do two charged particles with one charge and one third part charged particle with a different charge? Uh, what do they do when they move around one another? It turns out that's a problem Problem that can't be solved with pencil and paper. It's a very interesting problem mathematically. You have to solve it with computers. Even that is tricky and delicate and requires some special methods. And so as an undergrad, what I was working on was basically how to go from certain ways of writing the equations uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to how to turn that into computer code. And I was doing that using software tools, uh, specifically uh, a package called Maple, which is a tool for mathematics and mathematical programming that also had already a concept of notebooks. The concept was really introduced by Mathematica, its predecessor, but Maple was the one I happened to be using first. Um, and that would turn that into C code that we could then run through programming in numerics. Um, and then, um, at the end of my undergrad, right before I came to the US for grad school, I had to teach a course on computational physics. Uh, I was basically, I started a master's before I just kind of jumped ship and, and immediately moved to a PhD program in the US. Um, and it turns out that in Colombia, I didn't have access to either Maple or Mathematica or MATLAB or IDL or these big proprietary packages were not available to me easily to teach classes with uh, because they're expensive, because they're commercial tools that cost a lot of money and we don't have that kind of budget in Colombia. And it turns out that open source software made it possible to do that um, in the sense that I, we were able to cobble together. These were the very, very early days of Linux. Uh, I'll spare you kind of the details. This was really, really like bubblegum wrappers and bubblegum uh, uh, wrappers and, and duct tape. But we made something work. Um, uh, and, uh, and to me, that kind of opened up this idea that with open tools, we could we could break through certain barriers to learning um, that uh, that were very important for me. Fast forward a few years, in the 90s, Guido van Rossum began thinking. Uh, so uh, Guido van Rossum is the person who created Python. Originally, he, he has a background in mathematics. He created it out of the Math Research Institute in the Netherlands and then moved and did the rest of his career in the US. By the time he it was in, the, in 1999, he was already in the US. Uh, and at working at, a, at a, something called CNRI and wrote a proposal to DARPA, which is the funding agency from the, from the Department of Defense that funds kind of exploratory high-risk projects uh, with the idea that everybody should be able to program. Now, the language in this grant proposal from 1999 is very specific about programming, right? Kind of software engineering. The whole, the word data science was in no one's radar at the time, um, but he did kind of have this vision that with an with an, an easy to learn and powerful and sophisticated language like Python, these ideas could be made available to a lot more people. And I had seen the need for that because even though I'm telling you that this worked in the 1994 with Linux and whatnot, it was super painful. And in fact, that course did not go well at all. And many of the painful lessons of why it didn't go well and why it was so hard to get undergrads working in C and with very low level tools is what kind of kept, kept in the back of my mind, motivating me to look for better alternatives. And Python in this regard was kind of a, big, a breath of fresh air because if we fast forward another 10 years to today, that same concern that Guido was expressing in the late 90s is our, was our concern say 10 years ago uh, uh, or more, but now with data, it wasn't just software engineering. It wasn't just writing software. It wasn't just programming as a computer science discipline. It was enriching using programming, but in a much richer world full of data and data sets that could come from the brain or from asteroids or from mangrove forests or from healthcare data, et cetera, et cetera, right? The kind of data that you all worked on. And so now computation when married to data is really everyone's business and you know it, right? You've, you've been in many of these classes, you've been in these auditoriums, you've been in Wheeler Hall, you know the scale at which we operate. This is now everyone's problem because for now, but because now what has happened in today's society is that computing is the tool that we need to use for understanding a lot of the world around us. Now, in this case, the focus is a little bit different. And I'm not disparaging software development and software engineering. I write a lot of code. I, well, 
these days not so much, but I used to write a lot of code. I love software development, but there's a spectrum, right? And where computer programming as the focus of software engineering tended to be the discipline, kind of the, the purview of say computer science and industrial software uh, houses, now, this idea of understanding the world and using a programming language, but now as a microscope, as a lens to view the world, it goes far beyond that. It has a different, has a different set of kind of constraints and concerns where data is now a first class object, right? It's not just something you feed to the software, but rather you use the programming language to focus on the data, to think about it, to explore, right? And where the context of this data, its origin, the questions you're asking from it, who does it represent, uh, are absolutely central, as you've heard, um, including the human context and ethical implications of that data. Um, and where the output you're thinking of is not necessarily a software package, right? Your output is a story, right? It's these posters you have written out, or maybe the notebooks that you had that you wrote to produce those posters before, right? The output is a story of your understanding of the world based on this data. And that's kind of the space where Jupiter grew out of, right? Uh, Jupiter wasn't just a tool for like teaching my physics courses in undergrad. It's a tool that a big community of people created precisely to address this flavor of problems where you want to be very interactive. You want to explore, you want to learn, you want to iterate. You don't want to be focusing on the low level details, but rather you want to be able to think on your feet and use the computer as a thinking partner. Um, we wanted it to be open and free for all because we want to provide access to all. The architecture was designed with this idea of narrative as an output from day one. And we also thought a lot about making it very, very modular. Jupyter is not one thing. You may tend to focus on, especially on the introductory courses on uh, like data eight on just the notebooks and because that's the main core, but there's uh, the main kind of thing that you land into, but there's a huge architecture under the hood that supports many more things. And that architecture is built out of a set of Lego blocks that we can recompose in a variety of ways for building the things we want. Um, Jupyter Lab is a user interface that's much richer than just notebooks. It's more complex, but it exposes a lot more tools depending on what you're trying to do. The things you log into when you go to your homework, when you go take classes, are these cloud-hosted hubs that were actually, the original development of that was done by one of you. It was the main author of Jupyter Hub at the very beginning was a Berkeley grad student who did it, uh, who designed the first prototype and built it up. And another Berkeley grad student taught the very first course that was the predecessor to that uh, Jessica Hamrick. She's now a researcher at Google DeepMind, where she basically proved that one could teach one of these courses in the cloud, uh, right, using cloud infrastructure at scale. Um, in her case, this was Cox I-131, where she was a, a, a TA for her, for, for her PI. Um, and uh, Duper Book is the tool that we use to turn a lot of class notes and notebooks into textbooks that you see online, the data textbook, the data 100 books, et cetera, are built with this kind of technology. Um, if you're interested in kind of learning a little bit more about kind of how we think about this notion of computational narratives, um, we actually wrote uh, a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper, uh, Brian Granger and I, my one of the co-founders of Jupiter, is on Jupiter with me, and the person who basically I worked most closely with for the last two decades on Jupiter, where we kind of developed this whole idea of what is a computational narrative and why do we think that way about modern computing uh, uh, with uh, with data. Um, and so there's a, there's a reference there. Now, with these ideas, with this kind of approach, we actually, and this approach, which is very modular, very open, that allows end users and stakeholders to recompose the tools in the way that they need them, um, we can create uh, a huge amount of impact in many, many fields. You are kind of living proof of that impact. You all are, and the work that you're presenting outside is the is precisely the illustration of that impact. I'm only going to refer to a few things. I uh, obviously um, didn't have access to all of your work before, but this is work that you have seen, that you have benefited benefited from. But I want to highlight how important some of these things have been. Data eight um, has had a really major worldwide impact. The people who created Data 8 precisely wrote down that these ideas of inf connecting inferential thinking about the data, computational thinking about the algorithms, which is expressed in a programming language, and this real world context, right, of where the data comes from, and where these things are woven together in the act of analyzing, exploring, and learning from real world data sets was going to be a different way of looking at the world. 
That wasn't exactly what computer scientists traditionally had done. It wasn't exactly what statisticians had traditionally done. It very much follows in the Berkeley tradition. So in many ways, this is a reimagining of uh, Friedman. Friedman was a major figure in the statistics department. He passed away before I had joined, but his textbooks kind of guided the, a lot of the modern thinking in, the, in, in statistics and have been extraordinarily influential in, in the discipline for the last several decades. Um, but, uh, but in many ways, the birth of that age was a reimagining of the spirit of what Friedman had written in the 80s and the 90s. Um, in the modern context, right? Uh, and uh, uh, Ani Arikari, John De Niro, and Mike Jordan captured a lot of these ideas in a lovely paper in the Har uh, Harvard Data Science Review called Interleaving Computational and Inferential Thinking, Data Science for Undergraduates at Berkeley. If you've never read this, it's open access. You can read it. It's basically a paper written by Ani, John, and Mike about all of you, right? About how you learn. And they precisely talk about how the focus of this course is precisely on this idea of reasoning, visualization as a means of exploration and interpretation of the data, uh, right? But where those classical ideas that Friedman and others had developed two, two or three decades ago changed significantly once you make computation available immediately, right? Right at your fingertips. And it's not like, well, here's some mathematical theorems, here's some proofs about the assumptions on the distributions and whatnot. And maybe if you do a lot of work, you might be able to like drag all that data into a computer. No, you open things and you're you're always are living in an environment where you, where you can immediately try computational ideas and try, um, and try that. And they adopted precisely the Jupyter infrastructure as an initial starting point for the class. And I've talked to Ani and she basically tells me, look, we I don't think we could have we could have really built this course and this way of thinking about teaching if these tools had existed, right? So there's kind of a, a direct line connecting uh, connecting those early problems that uh, that I and others in the team encountered and that motivated us with what has been possible uh, for all of you. Now, uh, who here has taken the 159? Uh, anyone by chance? Okay, a handful of you. Wonderful to see you folks here. Um, so for those of you who haven't, STAT 159 is a course which is not mandatory for the data science major the way Data 100 is, but it, it's offered and many data science majors do take it. Um, that I teach, I'm actually just teaching it right now. We're just finishing this term. Um, and it's a course called Collaborative and Reproducible Data Science that tries to address kind of, it kind of, kind of tries to go a little bit beyond what, uh, what Data 100 does and where Data 100 focuses on the analysis uh, parts and the inferential parts um, and the modeling techniques. In 159, we kind of take a, take a step back and think about, okay, how do we do this computationally robust and trustworthy and think about the computational infrastructure um, of making science open, reproducible? How do we do this in teams? What are the social and scientific implications if research is not uh, is not reproducible? Um, and so there's a little bit of thinking about the why science should be done this way, which we really don't have the space for in 100. Um, we spend a lot of time then thinking about what are the fundamental ideas that enable, ena enable us to get that make it possible for us to get to those questions of why? And then how do we actually do that in practice? And so we actually build the skills and daily habits to make our work, the kind of work that you sort of did in 100 already, but now to create it in a way that meets kind of the modern demands of, of, of real world computational uh, data science. Um, the course is structured, obviously, given my own biases around kind of the scientific Python ecosystem, the same tools you've used in Data 100. But each of these tools that we dive into, and we, we go into tools that you don't see in 100, such as learning to use version control with Git from day one, the entire course is structured around version control precisely as one of the foundational layers of reproducibility. But these tools are really expressing an idea. Each of the skills we learn is mapped to an idea where you could do the same thing you might probably these days use Git almost everywhere, but you could do the same things in a programming language that isn't Python. You could use a different tool than PyTest, or you could use different tools uh, for than Markdown, et cetera, uh, so on and so forth. But the basic ideas, these ideas of ver control, using version control for your work, using a scripted programming language instead of only, say, spreadsheets so that you click around, automating your processes, thinking about your data analysis in terms of a coherent, uh, a coherent stack, testing your assumptions and validating what you do, so on and so forth. These are ideas that are universal and that you should understand. Um, we go beyond Data 100 in terms of not just focusing on notebooks, but going to a much richer 
Workbench, which is what Jupyter Lab provides, where now we're thinking about the entire data stack. We need to explore data sets. We need to run code at the command line. We need to write pure Python scripts and libraries. We need to manage uh, large files and so on and so forth. And that's what Jupyter Lab is for. Jupyter Lab gives you notebooks, but it gives you a lot more tools that allow you to tackle tasks that go beyond the, I have one document and I want to go from the top to the bottom, kind of adding and editing and learning, but now I'm stitching together an entire research workflow. And for that, you're now being exposed to learning sort of real computing um, in the cloud um, with tools uh, that allow you to do a lot more tasks that are the kinds of tasks that you will encounter in industry, that you will encounter if you go to a supercomputing facility to run, uh, to run, um, to run, say, large-scale models and codes um, if you work, say, up at LBL in a scientific collaboration uh, with the supercomputing folks uh, or, uh, uh, or similar. And so we, we take the foundations from that 100, but we take you kind of, again, one step further. Now you're going to learn, okay, well, how do I share my work with others? How do I turn my collection of notebooks into something that the world can see by publishing it uh, with, with Jupyter Book, which is exactly the same stack that we used to build um, the Data8 uh, textbook? How do I turn that into something that people can not only see as a textbook online, but execute? Right. It turns out that in the Jupyter universe, we have tools, and actually, some of you have benefited from these things in the past. We used to. I think now we link we link a little bit differently to it, uh, but uh, we have a tool in the Jupyter space called Binder, which allows you to take a bunch of Jupyter notebooks that are connected to a repository of code where you've explicitly listed these are the things my code needs to run. As long as you've told the system in a little file, this is what I need for this code to work, and there's a way to say that then Binder will automatically do the magic of using cloud computing tools called Docker and Kubernetes, which some of you may know about, but you don't need to. And the point is that most scientists shouldn't have to become cloud engineers to share their work so that you can now give one link to your work that somebody could click on and without installing anything with just their browser, they can log into a live, rich, executable version of it. They could maybe try a different parameter. They could explore a different question. They could change, uh, change the model. They could upload their own data file into it and try your method with their data, so on and so forth. Um, in this course, we also do something that I've already added a sprinkle, and some of you in Data 100 actually have had a guest lecture by Shel Gentleman, um, because I was also interested in bringing some ideas about how data science is not only about social data, but about how data science ideas apply to the natural world. And I'm delighted to see that many of your projects actually outside go in that direction, which is awesome. I saw the asteroid project. I saw some climate-related projects. I saw some neuroscience projects. Um, and so I've tried to add to Data, to data 100 a sprinkle of tools and intellectual motivations around modeling or, uh, in, with physical data and around the earth and climate. And, um, and in Stat 159, we go deeper. We cover some of the same material that we cover in 100 with, uh, with Dr. Shell Gentleman, but we go deeper in that now the students have to actually grab a paper that Shell Gentleman wrote when she was doing uh, research in oceanography a few years ago around uh, heat waves in California uh, based on uh, changes in temperature on the ocean just uh, outside of Northern California, which she did in MATLAB before she had kind of joined the wave of using the open source Python ecosystem. And your job is to say, if I understand her research and I read her paper and I have her MATLAB scripts, which I can't run, can I actually get back to her figures? Can I replicate the, her scientific results by using the stack of tools that I've learned in Data 100 and in 159 and get effectively back to producing figures comparable to her figures? And the answer is yes, you guys all can. And you're not oceanographers and, and working in a team in a few days, you are able to replicate what was a groundbreaking research paper just a few years ago um, in a completely, with a completely different language. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And it speaks very highly to the kind of skills that you all have and the impact you can have with them. Um, at the end of the course, um, the students learn how to bundle all of that into what I call the reproducible research compendium, which is this idea of creating this public website that uh, that is built with Jupyter Book that has kind of the entire narrative story. The, uh, the main part of the story, which is where the scientific narrative is constructed, but supported by the, the detailed notebooks that have all the nitty gritty of the analysis and how do you make each and every plot and how do you get each table, which then themselves rely on supporting code that is properly tested, that you can install, that is a proper Python library and so on and so forth, and that anybody can reproduce because it's you can launch it on Binder and you can access it. And so kind of this idea that you can all basically do what honestly for many people is like 
cutting edge of the best practices in industry and modern research. This is what just off of a data 100 with one more semester we get to build here. All of this, we do it here because in a sense, we're leading in the world, but we're also following, we're kind of also riding a wave of change in how science is practiced. Um, NASA started leading a program called uh, the Transform to Open Science to really change how all of NASA funded research um, is approached so that all of the practices uh, of how the research is conducted, all of the access to the data, et cetera, are made around, uh, are built based on principles of open science. This program is led by the same person, Shel Gentiman, uh, this colleague, um, and the program began in 2022. And by now the program has declared 2023 to be Initially, it was declared that it would be the NASA year of open science, and you can learn more about it by uh, by scanning that scanning that QR code or just googling those words. It's pretty easy to find. But after NASA did that, then uh, they coordinated with all of the federal agencies to declare 2023 the federal year of open science, right? And so now all of the federal uh, scientific agencies are coordinating their policies to really take these practices that you learn in Data 100 and, and, and 159 to how is research done across all the U.S. federal agencies. This is a really a kind of a major sea change in how science is being done. Um, and the scientific societies are adopting this um, and particularly focused on, 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 on this the scientific society called AGU, the American Geophysical Union, which is kind of a scientific piece of the earth and space sciences world. It's the society that covers all of that. And over the last few years, they basically said, look, in addition to like publishing old school PDF papers, we should really lead with recognizing that this is how science is being done now. And so let's include, oh, Jupyter Notebooks in our publishing pipelines. And now they've actually made a formal, they have a formal program called Notebooks Now to really push the construction of these kinds of documents as a primary part of the scientific record. Um, and as part of this effort to building open science for the world, very much in the Berkeley tradition, a number of us from the Berkeley Data Science Program, together with colleagues at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and the University uh, and Columbia University in New York, got together a couple of years ago, and we decided with, that we had to create an organization that would expose, that would offer these kinds of tools and infrastructure to other places than say Berkeley or Columbia or UBC, because each of us had been able to basically in conjunction with other teams, like the team that manages the, the, the hubs that you all have access to here on campus to create that kind of infrastructure for our institutions. But a university is not a business. A university is not an organization that can be producing, kind of like serving random companies or random other universities or random research groups by like signing contracts to say, yes, come on to our hub. That's just not how it works. So a few of us decided to create the separate nonprofit organization called 2 a to c that serves the mission of scientific research and education provides actually like contracts, um, but does so in a way that fundamentally all of its work contributes back to this open source ecosystem. Um, the executive director of this organization is now, uh, his name is Chris Holgraf. He was a former PhD from Berkeley who then worked with me as a postdoctoral researcher for a couple of years and who went on to run this organization that now allows us to do things like partner back with some of these NASA scientists. So this is in collaboration with Tasha Snow, uh, a researcher in Colorado who led a project to get funding from NASA to build, think of it like your Data 100 hub or your Stack 159 hub or your Data 8 hub, but now managed by this organization to serve the scientific community that from NASA uses data from a specific satellite called ISAT-2, which is a LiDAR altimeter, and some other related researchers who work on understanding the fate of ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland to build a scientific community, now not around a class, but around an entire type of cutting edge research data and scientific questions. Um, but again, offered in the same spirit of open interdisciplinary collaborative science that benefits uh, the world. And so um, to kind of come close to, to wrapping up, uh, I guess what I'd like to reflect on is how this architecture that we have with Jupiter that you've all experienced, and that kind of dates back to, at least motivation-wise, to these questions uh, and these problems that I had trying to teach these courses back in the 90s, and then that an entire team of people uh, and a huge community built, uh, built together lets us innovate um, pedagogically at scale. There's no way we could do this. I mean. 
think for a second, if we, let, let's say that it wasn't the situation I had in Colombia where I couldn't afford MATLAB or Mathematica for my students, let's say that we're at Berkeley and that we do have site licenses for MATLAB. So in principle, every one of you while you're a Berkeley student can install MATLAB. Let's ignore for a moment what would happen to you after you leave Berkeley and you don't have that free license as a student. Let's leave that fact aside for a minute. Imagine yourselves in data eight. And on the first day of class, the instructor says, okay, everybody go and figure out how to install MATLAB on your laptops. Now we're doing tech support for 2000 people. That's just completely unthinkable. Uh, now, of course, those folks have moved. Eventually they did move to actually supporting versions of their stuff in the cloud as well for good reasons, uh, right? But, uh, but now we need a toolbox. Now we want a special configuration. We want to add this other thing. None of that would be viable with the proprietary tools. We can do this. Not only can we innovate, we can do it at scale in a way that would be unthinkable with proprietary tools, um, which helps us democratize data and computational education in a way that we think is really important. It's part of our mission at Berkeley. Um, and I would argue it supports a really deep transformation at Berkeley. I've kind of been here now since I came to Berkeley at first in 2008, and I've seen the process of these courses grow from little experiments like what Jess Hamrick did with a course that ironically was MATLAB based. And she, when she did this first CS131 pilot, she said, I don't want to teach that with MATLAB and I don't want to teach it by like bundling zip files full of MATLAB scripts on B courses. What I want to do is have something with Python open in the hub in one place where I know what the students are running. And she did it and she managed to get it running after Min had created the very, very first earliest prototype of Jupyter Hub. They were both at the time, well, Jess was a PhD student and I think Min at the time had, I think he might have just finished or he was finishing his PhD. Um, and that glimmer of a beginning of a transformation is now something that is impacting the world in a major way. Um, and so there's a lot more uh, where this came from that we can build together. What you are doing, what you're demonstrating here is exactly building on these foundations. None of this would be possible without the work of made some people who are in this room, uh, like I know uh, Eric Van Dusen is in the room, the, the people who created this course, these courses originally, that I ate was originally created uh, uh, in this, in kind of this vision of the, of the project was created originally uh, uh, years ago by a team of faculty who kind of put their weight um, behind, uh, behind uh, this vision and made it possible administratively and structurally created these programs. Uh, huge call out to Anthony who has done uh, an amazing job. I also saw this program. I remember the early meetings when, when this program was like a handful of students and how, uh, how it has grown now into something, um, something amazing. Um, and, uh, and finally, special congratulations that two of these people have recently been recognized. Uh, Yuri Panda, who's one of the engineers who manages uh, the hubs and who has contributed a huge amount to the development of Jupyter itself, uh, was recognized as the, uh, this year uh, with a Chancellor's Outstanding Staff Award. And uh, Ryan Love it, who's in the stats department, uh, who is not here because he's in the meeting I just snuck out of uh, to come to talk to you, uh, was just nominated as one of the 2023 Jupiter Distinguished Contributors. So special congratulations to them, but a huge thanks to the entire team that makes this possible um, and to all of you for the great work, for having been great students. Um, and so good luck on the rest of your future and thanks for your time. Okay, so we're going to be moving on to student presentations now. If we could get high spatial resolution mapping in, of emissions and air up to the stage first. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nilu, and my project was high spatial resolution mapping of emissions and air. Um, so as an overview, the purpose of this project was to track CO2 emissions in the Bay Area. Um, most of this data is collected through Beacon or Berkeley Environmental um, air quality and CO2 network. Um, so these sensors are placed all around the Bay Area and they create quite an expansive uh, CO2 inventory. Um, so the problem at hand was that we were missing measurements for um, aviation data uh, emissions. So my goal was to uh, add these missing data using the three main airports in the Bay Area. San Francisco International Airport, uh, San Jose Airport, and Oakland Airport. So uh, my end goal was to use the number of landings at each airport to calculate the CO2 emitted from each site. So here we can see the Bay Area Emissions Inventory before I started um, my project. Uh, we could see that the data is collected from uh, the beacon measurements, and um, we can especially see a concentration of CO2 around the major highways, 
as well as the refineries. The three circled points are the three um, airports that my project was dealing with. So where did this data come from? The data is a combination of multiple data sets uh, obtained from various sources. Some were available to the public, but others had to be retrieved through um, public requests put, down, put out to their respective cities. So as I mentioned, um, the calculations were done by merging a few different data sets. So for each airport, I found the number of landings per month, the most common aircraft types landing at each airport, the respective engines of these aircraft types, and finally, the uh, fuel, fl fuel flow per engine type, um, or how much each engine burned. So for my model, I started with the raw landing data, and I cleaned it, and I removed all post-COVID data because COVID created some um, discrepancies that we could see stabilizing over the next few years. Next, I researched the most common aircraft types landing at each airport, and um, I matched them to their respective engine types. Um, after that, I found the fuel flow for each of these engine types um, during different stages of takeoff. I also found how much time was uh, spent during each stage of takeoff. For instance, the time it takes for a plane to um, speed up on the runway is about 42 seconds. Um, after that, I converted the tons of fuel burned to the tons of CO2 produced per hour. This was done using the conversion, um, conversion factor 3.16 kilograms of CO2 is equivalent to one kilogram of aviation fuel. Then I used a sinusoidal regression model and trained it on the data we had. And finally, I expanded this model to include future predictions as well. This uh, model was repeated for each of the three airports. So here we can see the outputs um, produced by these uh, regression models. Uh, we could see a yearly cycle that peaks in the summers and uh, drops in the winters. And we can also see for SFO and SJC um, an annually linearly increasing um, trend. So as we saw earlier, this was the Bay Area Emissions Inventory before. And through the analysis and calculations, um, we were able to add these three points to the inventory. So although this was a great foundation for aviation data in the Bay Area, aviation data in the Bay Area, um, uh, we could actually get a little more exact. So we can start with weekly fluctuations, which shows what days of the week are most popular for flights. And we can even dive, dive deeper into the hourly fluctuations, which is what time of day um, are there the most flights landing. After, that, after we finish um, aviation, we can move on to other missing data points, such as ports like the Port of Oakland, and um, residential areas as well. Thank you. So our project is focused on helping uh, Berkeley Wireless Research Center to build the machine learning based analog and mixed signal, mixed signal circuit design and modeling technology. Oh, okay. So Berkeley Wireless Research Center is trying to develop a new circuit design technology that focuses on uh, building a cloud-based service for researchers outside of BWRC can uh, access these tools and test their machine learning models, which means for uh, any general ML researcher uh, in the academic or in the technology field, they can use this model, or use this service to uh, generate analog and mixed signal circuit designs using the existing uh, BACnet and auto circuit frameworks, which is also uh, made possible by the BWC uh, project team. And our goal is to create a new open source sandbox for researchers to build uh, ML frameworks for circuit simulation without uh, prior sophisticated electrical engineering knowledge. Uh, so BACnet, or Berkeley Analog uh, Generator with Layout Optimizer, is an evolutionary-based optimization algorithm for designing analog circuits using layout generators. This learning framework enables us to print out the useless space of design, uh, uh, design circuits and save us time on long simulations. And also, auto circuit uh, is a machine learning tool which adopts a reinforcement learning and it is used for post layout circuit design and to find the parameter find the optimal parameters and it also uses hardware description language to uh, 
do the simulations to also help for parameter optimization. And here's our our circuit chain is our entry and circuit optimization pipeline. It is break down into three parts. The first one is the reinforced learning environment, which allows Q learning. And the second is the client server interaction. And the third layer is the user authentication. So our pipeline currently have, mostly has support for reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning or RL is a type of machine learning where there is an intelligent agent that takes some action that modifies the environment and receives some reward or penalty based on that. And then based on the reward or penalty, it decides if it wants to take that action again. It's actually a lot like training your dog to sit by giving it treats. Um, there are various approaches or policies to reinforcement learning, and the one that we use is Q-learning. So we specifically use tabular Q-learning, which is where an agent uses a Q table to keep track of which actions are favorable or not. And this table is updated through an equation called the Bellman equation. So essentially what this does is it takes into account um, the reward as well as the expected reward in the future to decide uh, whether or not an action is favorable. Um, and at every step, the agent has two options. It can explore, which means it just tries out a random new action and then updates the Q table based on that, or it can exploit meaning it uses what it already knows from the Q table. Um, as time goes on, this agent will start exploiting more than exploring because it has more information available to it. So tabular Q learning is specifically good for small, discrete action and environment spaces, but otherwise deep Q learning is the standard and it is what we want to move towards. So the fundamental problem that many circuit designers have today is that circuit simulation workloads are too large to run on a consumer device like a MacBook. So this is why we adopted a client server architecture where researchers can send their simulation jobs to the cloud and then receive their results after they're finished. We are currently hosting our simulations on the Google Cloud platform, and this is broken into two components, authentication and simulation. Users can generate ID tokens to authenticate their API queries using our Google Firebase portal. And then our simulations are currently run on a single E2 VM instance running Debian on Google Compute Engine. And our current implementation runs at roughly 60% CPU utilization with a monthly cost of around $30. Um, our system supports uh, multiple users to use our software and service at the same time. And to authenticate the users, we use Firebase as a cryptographic um, library and service. Um, the way we do it is each user gets its own token and we authenticate the user using that token. And our authentication process supports custom expiry date, uh, expiry time, and it integrates seamlessly with all of our server functions. So, Ultimately, we were able to create an end-to-end -end example where we optimized a mock inverter circuit through authenticated requests. So the actual simulation occurred on the server while the RL script ran on the client. And this graph of rewards over time shows how the um, model was able to optimize the parameters on the mock inverter. So this validates our proof of concept and paves the way for additional simulation functionality and support for a variety of ML methods. Uh, regarding the next step, we'll be doing more implementations on the circuit simulation tools, such as moving NGSpice, a open source circuit simulator uh, toolkit on the server side. We'll also be adding uh, HTTPS to encrypt messages between player, uh, uh, client and server, the secure protocols for public ser facing service, as well as adding support for additional softwares. Uh, thank you all for. Hello, everyone. My name is Kat. I am Si Xianbu. And I'm Max. And our data science discovery project explores nature-based climate solutions and whether uh, planting trees can help find, fight climate change. Uh, so our project focuses on nature-based climate solutions, which aims to utilize terrestrial ecosystems uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change through their potential to remove and store carbon from the atmosphere. Um, more specifically, our team focused on improved forest management carbon, pro carbon credit projects, uh, like, for example, projects that plant trees. 
Um, and for those who are unfamiliar, carbon credits are generated based on the amount of carbon sequestered by the project, uh, which can be sold on carbon markets and provide a financial incentive for organizations and individuals to participate in these nature-based climate solutions. And so as a result, improved forest management projects have issued nearly half of the carbon credits in the voluntary registry offsets carbon market. And while these carbon credit projects are gaining traction as an effective method for reducing carbon emissions, it's still unclear whether or not they're actually working. So in our research, we aim to suggest a remote sensing based evaluation method for uh, the effectiveness of nature-based climate solutions, as well as evaluate how trustworthy they are uh, in the reported voluntary registry offsets market. And for our data, we extracted remote sensing data from Google Earth Engine for the carbon credit uh, project areas and their baselines to get the observed uh, carbon absorption. And we established the baseline by using a two kilometer buffer area that surrounds the project area uh, to estimate the carbon absorption that uh, would have occurred in the absence of the project. And so the project area is where the trees have been planted and then the baseline is where they were not planted. And we also downloaded data from uh, Berkeley's carbon trading database uh, to get numbers on how much carbon absorption uh, was reported for each project and comparing the observed versus reported carbon absorption allowed us to evaluate the trustworthiness of these carbon credit projects while comparing the observed project area with the baseline uh, allowed us to evaluate the effectiveness of the projects. So our first re result tries to answer that how effective are those carbon offset projects. We did linear regression on the additionality of project baseline from, from baseline. And we used the slope difference between and after the project starts as an evaluation. Just like the right project, you can see it has an increasing trend additionality after it starts. So we think it's a good project while the right one is not. So we found that there are 27 over 56 projects has a positive slope difference. Furthermore, as you can see the, this column chat, this is the slope difference distribution. And surprisingly, it follows a normal distribution centered around zero. We think this indicating that the absence of consistent observable carbon reduction across projects. And also, as you can see in the following charts, the mean slope difference for improved forest management projects shows the greatest potential, while the, uh, the of afforestation projects shows the least. And also, um, projects located in East Asia and from CAR registry show the largest slope difference. So our conclusion is that such differences reflect inconsistency across project types, regions, and registry. Yeah, so next we looked at the credibility of these projects. And we did this by comparing the carbon offsets that were reported by these registries and the carbon that was estimated from our remote sensing data. So basically, we're trying to see if what's being reported matched what we measured. And here you'll see a figure of the project with the most carbon offsets out of the projects that we looked at. And you'll notice this discrepancy between the blue line, which is what they reported, and the orange line, which is what we measured. And this is a pretty big problem because this project alone is on the scale of two over 2 million uh, offsets being issued. And if it's not being reflected from what, our, what we're measuring, then this is not actual carbon that's being removed. Um, and so in the future, we want to incorporate more projects globally um, in our analysis. And we're also aiming to refine our baseline method by comparing our current use of the two kilometer uh, border with other methods to see which is most appropriate. 
Uh, we also want to compare what we found with what other research projects have found to see if this is a kind like a, a common trend and if our use of remote sensing matches what other methods have found. And finally, we want to apply explainable AI to find the uh, factors that are most effective for these projects. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for the program. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I am presenting on the faculty hiring analysis. Um, the predictability of job performance is a central issue in the study of organizational psychology. Essentially, how likely are you to be good at your job in a year or in 10 years? And previous works that have studied this have, in our opinion, missed several key factors. First and foremost, they use a very qualitative and subjective measure, which is supervisor ratings. And the other thing is um, they failed to quantify by the field in which the researcher or the faculty member was in. Therefore, uh, for our present study, we wanted to conduct essentially the largest ever study on academic faculty members and their job performance across the years. And we wish to do this by studying their citation count. Essentially, we believe the citation count is the most accurate measure of their academic impact and essentially their job performance. So um, our sample uses OpenAlex, which is a humongously large global research system containing hundreds and millions of works, authors, institutions across all of recorded history. And for us, for this study in particular, we took a 30% random sample of authors within the US whose first published work occurred in 2012 or later. And also we stratified across all 19 of their fields. So we have about 600,000 authors in this study. So what are we measuring? Um, we're measuring two main things. First, the stability of their percentile ranking. Essentially, in their first half of their career, um, what percentile do you rank within your field? So are you within the 50th percentile, the 60th percentile, and within the next half of your career, so the next five years, are you likely to move up or down in this percentile ranking? So essentially, we're ranking them within their own field. So we have 19 different graphs, and you'll see them in a little bit. And we believe that this accurately reflects essentially job performance across all of these fields. Our second analysis is a lag regression. A lag regression basically tracks how much your citation count in year one affects it in year two, how much year two affects year three, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so um, our first result basically closely uh, correlates with most um, studies out there. It shows a pretty strong correlation between early career success in terms of citation count and late career success. You can see on the graph on the left, basically um, their correlation, sample size, and p-values for all 19 of these fields. And it's basically a very clear graph. However, uh, we decided to measure for another specific thing, which you'll see in the next graph, which is a three-year horizon. So the purpose of a three-year horizon is to, to control and to, cor and to correct for the effect of bombshell works. Essentially, if you win a Nobel Prize with your very first published piece, you're likely to be a very good researcher, and you're also likely to be cited on that work for years to come. And as a result of that, you're likely to be, there's going to be a significant correlation between your performance later in your career and early in your career, simply based on the effect of this one work alone. Therefore, we wanted to correct for that by accounting for a three-year horizon. Essentially, if you publish a work in 2013, you will only be counted for your citations in the next three years, and everything following that will not be counted. And with this very simple change, we see that the significant correlation we saw in our previous graphs essentially dries up. Uh, as you can see in the graphs on the left, there is essentially no correlation and a negative correlation between performance early career and performance late career for academics across all of our sample size, which is quite a significant difference. Uh, to further elaborate on our three-year horizon, um, what we have here is a density plot between how much of your citations you receive in the three-year gap and how much you receive total. So the graph is kind of difficult to read, I apologize for that. Uh, but essentially, uh, we have a median value of how much of your citations you receive within the three years. And if you are lower than the median, you are the blue line on top. And if you're higher than that median, you are the yellow line on the bottom. And essentially, how, uh, if less of your citations occurs within the three-year work, you are likely across the board to be in a higher percentile ranking than those who have most of their citations within the three-year gap which is a pretty surprising result for us. It's something we did not expect to measure before studying the study. And lastly, moving on to our lag regression, um, it kind of correlates to the similar thing where although you can see a pretty significant correlation between works year by year, when you account for works years in the future, there is essentially very small correlation between the effect of your citations in year one and the effect of your citations in year 10, for instance. So 
This differs pretty significantly from previous studies. Uh, we believe that this is because we also stratify these by academic field. So as you can see, although some academic fields follow a pretty linear trajectory, there are a lot of academic fields that don't. And of course, this warrants a lot of further study, which we're going to intend to do in the next semester. But uh, it's, it is a very significant and surprising result for us on this case. So our interpretation of results. Um, although our initial test proved a stronger predictive validity than previous works, uh, we believe that controlling for variation between fields as well as the effect of bombshell works, all of this strong correlation essentially dries up. And yeah, it's, uh, it shows that the persisting effect of significant works early in career may affect the overall data and show that uh, essentially correlation between early career success and late career success may not be as easy to predict as we initially imagined. So with that, um, our next steps are to basically track further contributions to see if we can quantify this number further and to also track how much each institution, so the institution that the researcher or faculty member comes from and how much they affect the citation count of the author. And of course, we recognize that there are several limitations. Essentially, the first of being survival bias. Um, our sample tracks 10 years of author data. And if you're likely to be there at the end of 10 years, you're probably doing something right. And you're probably a pretty good academic in itself. And therefore, we would like to track for a way to control for this survivorship bias. Um, essentially, uh, there's a lot of work. There's a lot more work for us to do, but it's a very surprising result for us that we did not expect at the beginning of our study. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to represent my team to present our project about exploring animal uh, behavior classification method. And our pro project is um, collaborate with Dan Lab to work on Parkinson's disease, which can be characterized by motor deficit and sleep deficit. And unfortunately, currently, there's no solid cure to treat this disease. But one thing we can do to prevent the patients from deteriorating to a more severe stage is to uh, diagnose this disease as early as possible and try to rescue as much neuron as possible. So by using an unsupervised classroom methods, we hope that we can discover the naturally occurring statistical behavioral clusters in Parkinson's disease model mice and wild-type healthy mice. And this might be indicative of which neuron circuits are run in a Parkinson's disease and eventually provide insights for early diagnosis and disease-modifying therapies. So this is an overview of our project, which can be divided into four different stages. Um, and currently we're working on developing GUI so that um, some lab researchers who don't know how to code can also benefit from our code. For the first part, post estimation, we use Deep Lab Cut, an open source toolbox for animal post estimation. Um, but one of the difficulty we encounter is that we try to study the sleep behavior of the mice, and therefore we have to provide a comfortable bedding for them. And therefore we don't have a transparent base for us to take the camera from the bottom, which increase our difficulty to label the mice. And our solution is just experiment with uh, varying parameters and neural network architectures. And we, we also add more labels to improve our accuracy. So um, as you can see that in the end, the machine label cross and the human label solid circle almost overlap, which is other, which uh, illustrate the consistency between these two methods. For behavioral clustering, we actually tried several different methods um, and most of them are open source, but also have some limitations. Um, they do provide some useful insights for us to develop our own algorithms, but for the sake of time, we're, um, I'm not going to dig deep into it. Um, but the main logic of our algorithm is that we discover uh, different behaviors have different movement trajectories. And this is a 3D plot and 2D plot of one of the behavior that we are interested in, which is locomotion. And basically, it's the mouse moving from one location to the other. And you can see that their trajectory and the variance we computed are quite, um, are quite sig significantly different from the other behavior that we are interested in, which are from the left-hand side to the right-hand side um, are non-locomotion, locomotion, and non-locomotion immobility and locomotion respectively. And their um, trajectory and variance are quite different. So from left-hand side to the right-hand side are about 400, 3, and 20,000. 
Um, so next, we just compute the total variance and the kinematics in there on atomical axis to uh, design our matrix. And by kinematics in anatomical axis, we mean the posterior anterior axis and left right axis um, for the velocity angular change and also displacement. And we fit our feature to the PCA and use hierarchical agglomerative clustering to do the classification. Um, and in the end, we use median smoothing to mitigate the effect of outliers. And this is a sample video of when we apply our model to, to the mass. So this is when it's doing non-local motion because it's moving in its own place. And while it's transitioned to, um, or it's transitioned to the, the next behavior, our algorithm can be quite sensitive. Quite sensitive. Now it's uh, in the local motion stage. And this is, uh, the Bezoi method is another algorithm developed by other people. And uh, you can see that it's not, quite accurate compared to our method. Uh, now we have the cluster behaviors. However, uh, the clustering based on kinematics alone is not able to tell all the uh, behavior that we are interested in. For example, in the immobility group, the mouse can be sleeping quietly or waking quietly. And the only way that we can tell whether the mouse is waking or sleeping is using the EEG and EMG information. And the little widget on the head of the mice is the fiber and the electrode that we use to measure the EEG and EMG information. And here is the, uh, is the data that we use a well-established lip scoring method provided by Denlab to measure uh, the EEG and EMG information. And the EEG is basically measure whether the mouse is using or contracting its muscle and the EM EEG information can tell whether the mouse is in uh, REM sleep or non-REM sleep, which are rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement stage. And the alteration uh, and combining with the behavior that we cluster, we can get our final plot, which is a coordinate um, your activity and uh, animal behavior plots. And this can tell us a lot of information, for example, for, for uh, Parkinson's disease mice and healthy model mice, because the alteration and the sequence of the animal behavior is very important. And previous research has shown that um, the abnormalities in the alteration sequence of this kind of behavior can be the indicator of whether uh, a patients have early symptoms of Parkinson's disease or not. And we just apply our data to um, to get some initial result. This is the duration and speed of the rearing behavior in control mice and uh, knockout mice. And, uh, knockout mice uh, is just gene stands for gene knockout, which is equivalent to Parkinson's disease mice. And you can see that the duration and speed is very different across these two groups. And in the future, we'll um, continue to regress the neural activity on the kinematics data and to uh, study more neuron dynamics. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, all the students for presenting. It was really interesting to see everyone's insights. Now we're going to be moving on to the final showcase awards. Okay. So the first award is for the Data Science Insights Award, and the winner is Building Allele Analyzers from Human Genomes from CRISPR Gene Therapy, and that's Patrick. We'll be taking pictures like after. Next, we have the runner-up for the Data Insights Award, which is Exploring Animal Behavior Classification Methods. Next, we have the Rabinovic Excellence Award, which is with um, separating financial facts from opinions using bi-directional bi encoder representations from transform transformers. And the runner-up for this award is ensuring the longevity of just as specials foster care resource database. The Cloud Computing Application Award winner is the Faculty Hiring Analysis.
And the runner up for this award is the machine learning based analog link signal circuit. The data visualization award winner is the high spatial resolution mapping of emission and air. And the runner up for this award is analyzing changes in the affordable connectivity program. The team collaboration award winner is Fact Grid Cuneiform Project. Yeah, that's a long one. <laughs> And the runner up for this award is the Artificial Intelligence in Spirometry. Great. Um, those are all the awards. We're going to be having a small five minute break for you to look at um, the other poster board presentations. Yeah. 